our first show, none of our friends even watched us. That's how like, that's what, that's what made me be like, man, maybe nobody likes this because like our close friends, like all the people in like, uh, like hands of God and stuff like that. Like they all stood outside during our set. And I was like, damn, what? we suck. I was like, we fucking suck. Like not even our friends will watch us. I guess we are set to go. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. This is another episode of the Scoped Exposure podcast. Um, we travel down to California, uh, a much warmer place than it is here in Calgary. Um, I apologize to all the listeners who have just been talking about how cold it is up here in Canada, but, you know, that's the reality for the next few months. But, um, yeah, we welcome uh, Cole from the band Gulch onto the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Um, uh, Cole actually came recommended to me as far as someone that sh I should hit up from uh, Sierra from No Rights uh, Podcast. As, um, she had nothing but good things to say about you as far as what you're doing in the, in the community with the printing and all that kind of stuff. Um, but before we get super going on that, um, can you just give me a proper introduction of, uh, hey, my name's Cole. These are the bands I'm playing, and uh, this is where I'm based. Yeah, um, so I'm Cole. I'm based in San Jose. I'm the owner of Printhead, which is a small print shop um, here in San Jose, and a print for a lot of local bands and touring bands and things like that. And then I also play guitar in Gulch. Um, I used to play in a lot of bands uh, back in like 2014, 15. I was playing in like, I think at one time I was playing in like five bands, but now I just play in Gulch. Yeah, yeah. Uh a little slowed down because uh, things in your life have, have shifted since then. But um, yeah, I'm excited to talk For about sure. the printing operation they have going on and some of the, um, you know, the chapters that have brought you to um, that point. Before we get going, got to do the uh, the BevCheck portion of this podcast. Um, so I've, I've been holding off on this. It's actually the smallest Bev uh, that I've come across. It's a pilot. Uh, it's pi pilot's friend. It's like a fruit tonic uh energy organic energy drink i've only had this once okay. so this is the second time i'm i'm gonna be rocking it so uh yeah stoked on that crafted what kind of what kind of energy what uh, kind of energy you got there's that caffeine is it b12 it looks like uh let me read it if i can get that um definitely well it says organically grown ingredients so depending on how mm -hmm. um how reputable that is um but it looks it's like... totally cocaine <laughs> yeah. yeah it's 100 percent just... cocaine yeah all packed into this tiny can it looks like it's just <laughs> caffeine um got some sugar in it but nothing super um uh, i have this one energy drink can that i bought at the grocery store and it was like 50 cents but it literally looks like a hazmat like and it and it <laughs> it's it looks dangerous for sure but um what do you got on your end over there bud i have Okay, it's not about what I got, but it's about what I got it in. So I've got some H2O uh, filtered through my Mulligan kitchen faucet filter in my half gallon Yeti that I carry around me everywhere I go. Yeah, staying hydrated, which is, if anything, the most important Bev of all. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. And everyone should go out and get a Yeti because this shit is insane. Like, I'll put ice water in here and it will stay cold for days like literally days it just never changes temperature it's insane yeah uh I, i'm not sure how much of a camping buff you are but those yeti coolers have always been something that me and my wife have, have sought after as far as just being like mm -hmm. hey we could buy a bag of ice for this week of camping and it's not gonna melt so we we got yeah kind of like the knockoff yeti so it, it does a good enough job but yeah the for the price point it actually stands stands by what it says it can do so did you get the arctic um so i think it's so we have like you guys have like home depot uh down oh, there yeah. but we have uh, a chain called canadian tire and it's essentially kind of the same thing just up here in canada oh, so yeah. their mm -hmm. camping brand is called woods so we got that i think we paid uh like just 
I think we got it on sale, so it was like 150 bucks. Uh, but the Yetis, I think, start at like four or something around that. Oh nature. yeah, so it's expensive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How much did you pay for just the water bottle? I think the water bottle is like 40 bucks or somewhere around there. I'm not totally sure. Um, it was a gift, but I think it was like around like 40 bucks. But yeah, best but gift ever. It's it's probably the only water bottle that you can rock for probably most of your lifetime. So might as well spend the 40. Hell yeah. <laughs> Um, well, yeah. well, Cole, I'm excited to be chatting with you. Um, how I kind of intro and set context for all my guests is just ask them how they got into heavy music. So take me back in time. Um, tell me some of the f- most formative uh, records for you and how you started to discover you, discover this uh, um, underground uh, level of music. Yeah, holy shit. Okay, so way back, way, way back, I had a Walkman and it had like, the cool like you remember do you remember the walkman logo it's like that squiggly like liquidy looking thing and so i had that um i had my walkman and i used to go to uh either like sam goody if anyone remembers that store it's like i don't know I, they probably don't have that in canada but it's like an old ass like music store so i used to go like there and i'd get cds like my when my parents would take me and one of the first heavy cds that i got was uh toxicity from system of down so um yeah that was like that's the first heavy band that i can remember listening to for sure um and i remember i i heard them because of mtv that the music video for chop suey Mm -hmm. and i was like this is fucking insane like i've never heard anything like this and uh my parents like they don't listen to anything close to like the heavy music so that was like you know, I had no way of hearing it like otherwise. And so, you know, my sister would watch MTV and that one came on and I was like, this is fucking crazy. And so I got, I got the toxicity album and I listened to that thing over and over and over. Um, and then from there I would get into just like whatever bands were kind of similar to that. So like, I don't know, like disturbed or something, but, uh, but then when I was in eighth grade, I, um, I was uh, hanging out with this girl and she had an older sister who had a brother or sorry, an older sister who had a boyfriend who played in a band in San Francisco called uh, Seize the Night. And so she was like, hey, there's this show going on. And to me, a show is like, oh, it's a concert. Like, it's going to be like this, like, you know, concert venue or something. So anyway, she was like, you want to go? And I was like, oh, for sure. And so it was at this like DIY venue called the cave in San Jose where I saw a shit ton of bands there. But, um, so I went and I had like never seen anything like that. It was just like the, like you go in and you're like, okay, yeah. Like I, I know it's gonna be heavy music, but like and having never gone to a show, you're not really, you don't really know what happens during it. So I'm standing there and like the bands, you know, getting set up and then the feedback starts and I'm like, Oh, this is, this is like, this is pretty cool. And then the the room just like opens up. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Right. And uh, and everyone's like moshing and shit. And I, I'd never seen anything like that. And I was just like so drawn to it. I was just like, this is where I want to be every single weekend for forever. Yeah. And so that's what got me really going. And then I just started finding out about local shows and going to like, I mean, I think I went every weekend. If not, like if there was multiple shows in a weekend, then I, I would go to multiple shows. But um yeah that was i was just dove in from there yeah i I think most people's first show experience kind of was this like didn't really know what i was getting into when once i saw it like i just couldn't like like i just started to obsess over it and it was very similar for me the very first like hardcore show had pas falling that people were catching that didn't squish little old me and people like um you know doing like pile-ups for vocals and it was in like a basement of a church so all the ceiling tiles are bouncing all over the place i was like i've never seen this before but just became so like i want to be surrounded by that as many as as often as possible so that's very rad yeah um so we're gonna fast forward a little bit here so um you, you play in a couple bands but the main project that you're a part of right now is gulch um and you guys mm-hmm. uh you know have 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 had certain like jumping off points in the last couple of years, but you guys have been a band since, well, the, the first release that I could find of you guys from like was from 
2017. So can you talk to me about the origins of that band and how sonically you guys wanted to portray yourselves? Because it feels like you guys have kind of uh, carved out a, a lane of your own as far as like, you know, not being able to put Gulch sonically in one box. So talk to me about the early mm -hmm. Gulch days and um, some of those things. Yeah, um, man. So the singer, Ellie, and I were living in a house together in uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains at the time. And um, one of our other one of our other bands we were playing in called Spinebreaker, it's like a death metal band. We, um, we were just kind of slowing down at that point. And uh, so I felt like I wanted to, you know, do something different. And so I started... I just started writing some riffs and I wanted to try and write something like I'd never done before. And so, um, I don't know, I just tried, I just tried to write like some heavy stuff. And so fully, like when, when we first started it, I was just listening to a ton of like nails and things like that. And so, um, so like our demo for sure, like it obviously is influenced by nails. I think that comes across pretty clear, but, um, yeah, so like from from there, I was like, I really like the sound. I want to continue with this, but uh, with Burning Desire, I like I wanted to incorporate more more like punk and stuff, and like a little tiny bit of black metal in there, because um, Elliot at that time was listening to a shit ton of black metal, and so I was just hearing it a lot of it from just being around him, and so I was I, like certain aspects of it, I was like, I really like that kind of beat, or I like that kind of like tremolo picking or whatever, and so. Um, so I just started trying to incorporate that into it. And, um, when, when we had those songs and we were, and we were jamming them out with, uh, with our drummer, I was like, so on the fence, like, are people going to like this or are people going to fucking hate this? Because it's so, I mean, not that it's so different where it's like, it's groundbreaking, but it's just, it's not really like what other people were doing. So I was like, I was like, I really like this, but I don't know if other people are going to like it. And so, um, so yeah, I didn't really know how it was going to be received. And so luckily it was received pretty, pretty well. Um, except that I always, I love to talk about this and I'm glad I'm going to talk about it on a podcast so that it's forever on the internet. But uh, <laughs> our first, our first show, none of our friends even watched us. That's how like, that's what, that's what made me be like, man, maybe nobody likes this because like our close friends, like all the people in like, uh, like hands of God and stuff like that like they all stood outside during our set and i was like damn what? we suck i was like we fucking suck like not even our friends will watch us um and so so yeah i i don't know it was it was really like um as far as like sonically the sound it was kind of conscious but also not really like not really planned like we weren't we weren't like oh let's write something really different let's like try and be different yeah it was just experimenting with sounds and blending together what i thought sounded good yeah well that that's interesting to hear how you know not to call out hands of god specifically but like them not watching you on their on your guys's very first show and then you guys ended up doing like a tour together and and all that like oh yeah you know, years i mean later. we're all close friends <laughs> of course yeah we're all close friends and we were back then too it's just uh i don't remember what happened but they they just like i just didn't feel like watching us i guess <laughs> yeah that that is too funny but yeah i think I, I'm sure that some of the um, the the success of the band also probably played a part in you guys. You know, I I think the sound of you guys wasn't really playing up on any of the what was trendy heavy music wise. Like we've we've definitely gone a lot a lot of years um, in the you know call it hardcore space with lots of like metalcore. And now I'm seeing a lot of like more like new met new metal bands start to act like actual new metal bands, not like we're yeah. influenced by Iowa, but then it's it, it's just metalcore. So yeah, I think mm -hmm. having I, I've seen it where bands have had um, a way different sound, and even locally or internationally, you know, however you want to spin it, um, they've people have been like, yeah, this is really refreshing. Um, you know, Drain's a great example of that, where there hasn't been a lot of like crossover thrashy kind of bands but that band like kind of blew up within the last couple of years uh which is you know that's mm -hmm. a great brand for sure um yeah. yeah so uh as far as the time of releasing this uh you guys have um a release that you guys did in july um that album 
you know, is the longest gulch thing that's on the internet right now. Um, I, I found it with a couple of my guests that, that have released stuff during kind of quarantine, um, that the initial plans were actually way earlier in the calendar year than how mm-hmm. it actually came out. Was that kind of the same for you guys? Um, we weren't too far off from when we were originally supposed to release it. We were, um, we were aiming for like a April or May release. Um, and it ended up getting, you know, pushed back a little bit, but, uh, either way it would have happened during quarantine because quarantine here started in, uh, like March or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it would have happened in quarantine either way. So I, I didn't, I didn't mind. And, um, I don't know, maybe it's better that it came out later anyway, because then there'll be less of a gap between like the beginning of quarantine and whenever the fuck it ends and we can play again. Right. (laughs) Yeah. What's been the the biggest uh, aha or um, the biggest thing that people have been telling you about um, that release uh, since you guys dropped it? As far as like um, what they like about it or what? Yeah. Like either favorite tracks or just like, you know, musical directions that you guys did differently than the initial demo any like things oh yeah that, yeah um i haven't gotten a, a whole lot of feedback on like the music itself i mean like friends and stuff would be like oh this is really good or whatever but i hear a lot about the art a lot of people like the art and like how we stuck with the same artist that we did with the ep and so uh so yeah i think that was a good choice i think i think he killed it and um I don't know. A lot of people talk about the cover. A lot of people like the cover, even though a lot of people that like the cover don't know that it's a cover, that last track on the album. Uh, but a lot of people like that, which was interesting uh, because a lot of, I thought most people would figure that it's a cover, but a lot of people were like, wow, this song's really different. I hope they go more in this direction. And it was kind of like, it was kind of interesting to hear that because I was like, damn, like, if if somebody thinks that we did this intentionally, then I feel um a lot more comfortable experimenting further out from like the sound that we've done because it seems like people received it well and so that's kind of cool who who was the cover by because that that is news to me as well oh no way okay yeah so it's um it's a song from Susie and the banshees from uh it's from sometime in the 80s i can't remember when it was released but um it's like a like a goth song oh and uh we kind of we kind of reworked it into uh, something that sounded more like us but the first like half of that song is like pretty true to the original hmm. um yeah so we tried to stick as much to the original as we could except Elliot screaming and and the original is, is a woman singing but um but yeah yeah we had fun with it yeah yeah that is very cool and you know I think the sonic nature of your band is really interesting because there's a bunch of core kids uh, that like it, you know, people that are more into metal can pull away from certain aspects of the band as well. Um, I have a plethora of friends from like the, the scram screamo kind of community. Um, I filmed a fest mm-hmm. in 2019 in Toronto that had a plethora of bands in that, um, kind of department or genre. And a lot of bands seem to like that, um, like you guys as well from that. So it is cool to see just like, you know, despite being different the vastness that you guys kind of hit on on the music side is really cool yeah that's like extremely surprising to me because i figured that when we released this stuff i figured uh, like people who are into death metal be like this isn't fucking death metal this sucks like (laughs) like you know i mean and then kids who are into like punk like you know like hardcore punk or like this isn't like this is like bullshit punk this is like fucking like mall punk or something i don't know or like I, I just figured the purists would hate it. And there are some people out there, I'm sure, that are like, yeah, this is, I don't like that they, they're they not defining themselves in, like, they're dipping their 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 hands in a lot of different pots. But, um, but yeah, so it's, it's been very, very surprising to see, um, like, how positive the response has been from different groups. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know, like, when I think about, like, hardcore gatekeepers or purists of that nature like i feel like a lot of that is slowly being pushed away especially with things like the internet where and like people will just share stuff that they like and there's there's not only looking to certain individuals to co-sign a band 
that still that happens where you know you guys getting on this is hardcore that is unofficially joe saying like hey here's a band that i think you guys should pay attention to aka they're you know on my fest so you know that Mm -hmm. you know there's a level of that for myself as well i'm picking bands to you know feature on this podcast um you know put on the playlist but you know largely as far as people have this accessibility now that maybe they didn't uh 10 or 15 years ago to just like listen to a plethora of of different heavy genres of music which is in my opinion the right mm-hmm. direction versus only relying on on one person to uh to pick your um your library so for uh, sure yeah so um as i i needed to ask you because this will be the transition question to i guess the printing uh side of this podcast but um the infamous gulch hoodie that kind of hit the internet and started a meme of its own. Um, can you tell me about what that is for the folks at home who have no idea what that is? Um, and just if that was like, I, I don't think that that was something that just was planned uh, as far as like a, like a, like a big wig marketing strategy. It was just something that happened. So mm-hmm. talk to me about how that came to be and, and what, I guess your perspective on that whole uh, um, online internet thing. <laughs> Oh my God, man. That was like completely unexpected. It was so funny because basically what happened was we were going to play FYA and we had like no more merch designs like to use. And so we were like, um, okay, well let's think, oh yeah, there was that girl who like sent us this like MySpace style gif of that design it was like the sanrio characters with the gulch uh logo above it and it was all like sparkly and there was like butterflies like flying around it and shit and it, you know what i'm talking about like on my space we used to have like the gif and it would like loop or whatever so she had sent us that and we're like oh man that'd be funny we should put that like on a hoodie and make it like an exclusive thing for fya and we'll just make like 30 of them because it wasn't even a design that we were like wanting to do a lot of um so we just made 30 of them and we were like oh this will be cool and then and then i posted it online just to like promote it because i'm like man i wonder if people are gonna be like this is fucking stupid and so i was like you know i should like promote it ahead of time so that people aren't so caught off guard at the merch table so so i posted it and then it fucking like blew up and all these people were freaking out over it and i was like holy shit but by that time it was too late to make more and we were flying to to florida and so i was like i'm not gonna bring you know 50 fucking duffel bags full of these hoodies so i only had one big military bag and so that's that's all that fit and so uh we 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 um so we brought them to to florida and jokingly just because everybody was freaking out over them i was like oh here's our flight itinerary if you really want one just meet us at the airport (laughs) and lo and behold we yeah we get there we get off the plane and we go to baggage claim and there's this group waiting to buy the hoodie from us. Holy and I was shit. like, holy shit. Yeah. Elliot, our vocalist, he was, he was like, he was off like by the baggage claim and he comes over. He's like, yo, 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 just dude. He's like, there's fucking people here waiting for the hoodie. I was like, no, there's not. <laughs> he's like, yeah, there is. He's like, go. he's like, he's like, look at, he's like, look that group. They, they just asked me. I'm like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. And so, so I go over there and I sell um, one to each of them. There was like six people. And uh, so then I only had like Air, airport security is like, what's going on over here? Yeah. Yeah. They're like, what the fuck are you selling out of this bag? <laughs> um, so, so yeah. So then I only had like 24 left of them. And then we get to the fest and I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to set up any merch until we're done playing. Mm. And so like an hour before we even are on the stage, people start lining up at our empty merch table. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on like dude these people are fucking crazy and so i just wrote a sign that said like no merch until four o'clock or whatever time it was we were done playing and so like and so people waited go buy some other shit yeah yeah no but nobody would get out of line and so they stayed in line and the line spanned the entire fucking room while we're playing so like people people were weren't even watching you yeah (laughs) my god yeah they were waiting in line they were waiting for for that sanrio hoodie and um it was like it was pretty fucking embarrassing man because like it was like such a spectacle and like during our own set like people were in line and then after our set we had to like 
sell to all the people in the line and so like those people weren't watching the bands after us and weren't really watching the bands before us either and so it was just this thing man but um but yeah i mean it's cool and so once we saw popular it was we put them up online um after we got back home from florida and i think we made like a run of a hundred and 20 of them or something like that and we put them up and they sold out in like two minutes or something and so then i put up like 300 more and i was like i'll just print these later and i'll, I'll put them up now and i'll print them like you know next week or something and then that sold out in like 10 minutes and then and then we were like fuck and so we just did like a pre-order and then we ended up selling like 1400 of them or something that's so crazy um yeah i like just seeing all the memes and, and people that went to FYA and th that were talking about it. It's just like, so, so funny to hear the behind the scenes of like, you guys didn't intend to create this monster of a popularity for a hoodie, but it just kind of happened. Uh, just unbeknownst. to you. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's cool that like so many people liked it, but Oh my God, the controversy around it, just like, just everybody just pissed that they didn't get one and demanding that we put up more and then like mad that and then people go and flip it for a bunch of money and then this one dude was like calling us pedophiles because we were putting cartoons on our merch and like dude it was just this fucking this is mess dude it was just a fucking mess yeah do you remember like were you the one like selling all the merch and then you had to like break yeah. the news to the last guy who was like yeah sorry we don't have any more at the fest yeah it's it's usually me and uh our guitarist christian selling the merch um so yeah we just had to be like yo like they're gone i mean they were gone within like i don't know five minutes or whatever because like because there were so many people in line it's like and everybody who was in the front of the line wanted that hoodie and so the first you know 24 people got it yeah yeah it brings me back to um when the when the nintendo wii came out i was standing in line for it and just like you know just the line got longer longer throughout the morning before walmart opened and people were trying to buy their way into line and just like i remember yeah. people were just crying at the back of the lines because <laughs> they didn't like wake up early enough so um yeah and then i think because this was like when did the week come out i feel like that was like 2008 and uh for some reason mm -hmm. my my debit card had like a, a limit so I went to, when I went to go pay, it like didn't go through and I was like about to freak out. But my grandpa was with me. Oh, I was shit. like, don't worry, like I'll pay for it and we'll just go to the bank or something. So shout out to my grandpa. Yeah. Oh, and, dude, uh, that would have sucked. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. um, so kind of continuing from from that, um, I feel like that's a good segue into this next part. Um, as far as uh, talking about your printing operation, um, that's called Printhead. Um so give me the the Coles notes on just how the passion of like printing shirts kind of started and how the business kind of sprouted up. Dude, so like like most people that start their own business, it started because I was like, uh, well, okay, let me backtrack a little bit. So I was living, so I'm from California. I was raised in California, but I moved to Boise, Idaho in 2014. 14 or 15 I can't remember um with my wife and um we were gonna we were planning on just staying there forever we were like let's we did we were like let's uh let's just pick somewhere to to live and we'll we'll go there and live out the rest of our lives there so so we moved there and like a year after being there I just I just wanted to come back <laughs> I mean it was a cool place but I just wanted to come back and so I was like, all right, I want to go back to California, but I really don't want to fucking work for somebody. I fucking hate working for people. And so, um, and so I was like, okay, well maybe I should start a business. And, and then I started brainstorming like, okay, well, what do I know? And at that point, all I really knew was like coffee. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to start a coffee shop. Cause that's like, that's, that's like a really big thing to take on. So, right. and I was only 23. And so, um, so I was like, well, what else do I know? And I was like, well, I know how to use Photoshop and like I play in a band. And then I was like, well, like bands need merch. Like my band always needs merch. And we always get it printed from uh, a shop that's down in Southern California. And I was like, I don't even think there's any shops in Northern California that are printing for like hardcore bands. And so I was like, maybe I'll get into printing. Um, at that point, I didn't even know what the fuck it was called. I was just like, maybe I'll get into putting design on shirt. Like it was... <laughs> 
I didn't know anything about it. And so I just went on YouTube and I literally just typed in how to screen print. And I came across like a series of videos and it was like, oh my God, it was so many videos. It was like 20 videos or something. And they're all like, you know, 10, 15 minutes long. And so I just like grabbed a notepad and I just started watching them and like writing down everything that was important, like everything about like the equipment you need, everything about the types of inks, um, the processes of printing and stuff like that. And I was like, this is really fucking overwhelming, but I'm kind of committed. So I'm just going to go for it. And so, um, so I set a date to move back, uh, to California and I was going to live with my parents temporarily. And so I moved in with them and I was like, Hey, I want to try and start a, uh, a screen printing business. And I want to know if I can use, uh, your single car garage. And they were like, um, no. <laughs> and, and so I was like, I was like, come on, like, this is like my only, this is like my only chance, like where I'm going to be living rent free and I can like take a risk and try it. And if I fail, whatever, like, who cares? Because it's not like I'm going to, you know, lose my house or something like that. So, so I convinced them to let me do it. And so I, I, um, I bought just like a little rig of like a, it was like a four, uh, four color, four station press. And I had like a little conveyor dryer, a little flash dryer and an exposure unit and a couple screens. And so, um, from there, I just started like experimenting and, and trying it out. And I took, uh, like a, quarter of a semester of a screen printing class at a local college um and yeah from there i was like okay i think i'm, I'm ready to start and so i put the word out like hey i'm starting the screen printing business like if anybody needs shirts like let me know and fully knowing like i don't know how to fucking do this at all and i'm gonna have to figure it out on these people's orders <laughs> um and so a homie was like hey can you do this job for me and luckily it was just black ink on a white shirt and I was like I can totally do this I was like this is gonna be easy so um so he sends me the files I'm trying to figure out how the fuck to burn a screen and so I'm trying to like make the screen and like and I set it up and they all turned out fucking terrible because I didn't know what off contact was which I'm not gonna get into like the tech the technical aspect of that but I printed it like shit because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing and so so from there I just I just kept experimenting and and like I feel bad for all the first people that I printed for because I was really just trying to figure shit out on their orders. But, um, but I wasn't gonna, I wasn't about to go out and buy a bunch of blank shirts and pay money and fuck them up. Like I'd rather fuck up other people's shirts, you know. So, uh, so um, yeah, I just I just kind of learned through that, and then now I'm five years into it, and I'm in this big ass warehouse with my automatic press and my like 26 foot dryer and my wall of inks and yeah. my upstairs fulfillment center and um all the audio yeah. listeners need to go to this point in the podcast and, and see the uh the scale of what it was but you no know, it's really cool to hear just like the very diy like novice nature of like okay i got like you know it's it's a trial by fire kind of environment it sounds like for you where it was like, okay, I got these orders. I need to um, make sure that they're good enough that I can send out because, you know, the worst thing that, <clears throat> that you probably feared happening is like, oh, I sent out shirts and then they sucked and then no one else came. But yeah, it seemed like through the process of like working those extra hours and making sure it was okay. I think, I think I got it. And then that just happened over time. And that's, it's really cool to, to hear that you've been doing that full time since then like no kind of stops in mm -hmm. between. Nope. No, I've been slammed busy um, since like 2015. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, cause, cause I was slammed because I was printing everything by hand at that point. And so like, if I got a, you know, a couple 40 piece orders, I was like, holy shit. Like I'm booked out for like a while or whatever, but now it's like, um, you know, like basically what I'm saying is like, I, was I thought I was busy then and then I would scale up and I would get better equipment or I'd get faster or I'd get something that's more efficient. And then I would take on a bigger workload and I'm like, damn, I thought I was busy before. Now I'm really busy. And then I just kept doing that over and over because then, then I got into automatic printing and then I'm like, it's like, you know, we're doing, we're doing a ton of shirts in yeah. here. And so it's like, yeah, <laughs> I'm just going to keep thinking that I don't know what busy is. Yeah. You know, but, um, you know, uh, just on the, the process of like, 
you know, like you were saying, like having that entrepreneurial mindset of like, I really can't think about even just working at another screen printing shop where I'm like doing that all day for someone else. There's way more pride and focus on the fact of like, I might be putting in, you know, four to eight extra hours in this work day versus the regular nine to five folk. But, you know, it's what I love to do and it's, you know, my business on the line ultimately. So I'm going to make it, uh, make, make the orders happen, hit the deadlines that I need to. And, uh, no, that's very, very sick. Um, in your five year span, um, when did you integrate the automatic press? Cause that was something that you mentioned on, uh, Jamie's podcast, as far as like before, like it was just fucking with your back and your hands and you couldn't play guitar. So when did you make that shift to make it more, yeah. um, I guess, uh, technology, like automatic focused. Yeah, that was like t- maybe almost three years ago. It was like two years and like eight months ago or something like that. So <clears throat> I moved into a space and, um, I'd saved up enough money to, to buy an auto press and I bought one and I was so fucking scared of that thing. I have a different one now, but my first one I had, I was so scared of it because it's like, you because with with manual printing you're like so in control like you put the shirt on like you're the one like flooding the ink across the the screen and you're printing with your hands and like it's very slow and like you print you lift up the screen you're like okay does that look good and it's like oh wait no i should i should do another pass or whatever and it's very like there's always like quality checkpoints you know i mean it's like okay is this good is that good it's very slow with automatic printing it's so fucking fast like you can you could print like, I don't know, like, I don't know. I, I'm printing maybe like when I'm in a production run, maybe like 200 shirts an hour or something by myself. And so I can fuck up that many. Sh- I can fuck up 200 shirts an hour. Like, you know, like if everything's not dialed in, it's like, you won't know until it's you've already done. messed up like a dozen shirts. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so you just really got to like with automatic printing, I was so against it. Cause I'm like, man, fuck that. Like, that's like a machine. Like it takes like the art out of printing, but it really doesn't because most of printing has to do with setting up the art, like getting your inks right and getting your like color separations, right. And getting your print order, right. And all, all that kind of stuff. So what automatic printing does is it really just lets you focus in on all of the, it takes one variable out of the equation so like no longer am i the variable with like you know is my angle on my squeegee right am i pulling hard enough or whatever so it takes that that out of the equation so i can focus on all of the other variables that are way more important yeah. to be focusing on yeah for sure yeah i i don't think that there's any uh you know shame or anything on like oh like you're not printing it. That's not the punk or DIY way. It's like, yeah, you're, you're focusing more on, you know, the, the variables or the, the factors of what makes a good hardcore shirt. I, in my opinion, are what it's being printed on the, the design yeah. itself. And then the color choices, none of those things totally. are involved in like, you know, how much time each shirt took or any of that. So if you can focus, hi, be hyper-focused on that and then just let the actual time of, you know, um, doing the, the more meticulous processes, I, I think that's a way more efficient way of doing it and, you know, less of a physical strain on you as well. Cause 200 shirts, oh, yeah. like I'm sure you couldn't do, you couldn't even do close to that in an hour's time if it, it was you physically doing it. Yeah. I mean, God, man, by like the end of the day, my hand, my like forearms were just like shaking from just printing all day. It sucked. And then I go home and I try and play guitar and my wrists were all fucked up. My fingers were all fucked up. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely better, uh, phys- physically on me for sure. For sure. Um, so just in the, all, all the years of you doing all the, all the printing and the band stuff, I'm sure you have seen, you know, merch trends come and go and what's popular at certain times yeah. and what works and what doesn't. Uh, what's a, you know, a merch cliche that you just despise to all end? Oh my God, dude. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so, okay. So I'm sure, I'm sure I've done some of these late. Actually, no, I just did one. Um, not talking, not talking shit, not talking shit on the bands, but the fucking, the left chest print 
with the full back print is so cliche where it's like the like the band name on the left chest and then like a live shot or something blasted on the back with like a lyric is like the most cliche thing and I fucking hate it I mean whatever I enjoy printing it because I just enjoy printing but I'm just like oh dude again like really come on like come up with something different but uh but that's for sure a big cliche but I work with a lot of cool people that that try like really different things like I did um I just did some long sleeves where somebody printed like on the side like from the armpit down to the bottom hem um and so that was cool um and then when I do stuff for like tsunami they'll do like the belly rocker print which is interesting Mm -hmm. um Man, I know there's some other interesting ones I've done, but, but yeah, but I, I like some of the cliches, honestly, all the death metal cliches are like my favorite, like doing like both sleeves, you know, the sleeve prints with like the repeated logo going down and then like the front with like some crazy fucking death metal art and then the back or whatever. I like doing stuff like that. That's yeah. fun. Uh, do you have a specific item or style that you think more people should uh, tap into or that you've been personally doing a lot of recently? yeah so <clears throat> um i like a lot for like fleece independent trading co i like a lot of their stuff and then uh gildan has a line called hammer and they have fleece now so they've had the t-shirt for a while and i print i print a lot of that t-shirt the gildan hammer t-shirt but they also offer a fleece uh like a line of fleece for that same the hammer line and uh that stuff's really good um printing on gilded like regular gildan heavy heavy blend fleece is fucking trash that that hoodie should not fucking exist uh it sucks uh same with champion champion hoodies are fucking trash to print on it sucks yeah yeah they just like you're just paying for that that little c pill on the left (laughs) sleeve that's what you're paying for it's not super high quality. Everyone's like, oh, like I want something really quality, like like champion. And it's like, dude, it's not quality at all. It's basically a Gildan hoodie with a champion logo on it. Like it's it's really not that different. Damn. Shots fired at champion. But uh I think that's uh <laughs> no, that is I, I've totally seen that where bands are like, Yeah, it's on champion, but it's like I like um, so on the scope team, ironically, we have someone, his name is Cole and he's kind of like our screen, screen printing guru as well. His operation is a little bit more, uh, scaled back, uh, than yours is, but he's been like, yeah, check out these hoodies. Like they're just as comfortable, um, if not more than, than champion. But yeah, a lot of people are, mm-hmm. you know, just buying into the, the C pill, as you said. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I used to love Champion, and I still love their their reverse weave stuff because it's super heavy. Um, but yeah, just like their hoodies, I I hate printing on them because like I print a lot of water based and discharge inks, and you can't print. Um, well, you could, but it's a bitch to print um, water based, and you can't discharge them at all. And so I hate I hate using that stuff. But um, but yeah, best hoodie that's cheap is the Hanes Ultimate Cotton. That's like my favorite hoodie. That's my go-to. Yeah. yeah that's so, what all, of, that's what the Gold hoodie was on. That's what the Sanrio hoodie was on. So I now see. everyone will want it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, Cole, I think, um, you know, starting to wrap up here, uh, one of the questions I had, and, and I think every band, you know, whether it's their first or their 11th, uh, always has to think about merch and like, you know, what's the most important thing because you're trying to, balance you know how many colors it is to print versus the quality and and who do you go with so what what in your opinion is like the most important is it getting someone to professionally design something is it what it's being printed on is it how many colors where does your mind go with um what should be top of mind when you're trying to make something that's not just going to sit in a box in someone's garage for for a year oh for sure what it's printed on like it's definitely about what it's printed on. I think that's more important than <clears throat> than most things. Um, also, I mean, the design too. Like a lot of people send me really, really low resolution art that has to be like totally reworked. It's like I think I've gotten like a ready for use file from a hardcore band maybe like three times. Like their stuff is they always get stuff from the people who are like yeah I do design and it's like it's some fucking JPEG that's like 
two inches by two inches wide at like 72 dpi resolution and um yeah so like the art is for sure important but once you have the art ready to go what is printed on is 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 extremely important because if you print on some trash shirt like no one's going to want to wear it um because it or maybe they will i don't know it you know hmm now that i'm talking out loud and i'm thinking about it maybe they will because there's shirts that I own that are trash shirts, but I love the band. So, so I still wear them, but, uh, it might, it yeah. just not, might not be your go-to when you're like dressing yourself in the morning or like, ah, I actually don't like, there are certain shirts where it's like the, the design might be super simplified, but I'm like, Oh, this feels nice to wear. I'm definitely like doing this. And then it's like <clears throat> in the laundry. So I was like, ah, I guess, you know, the, the Gildan heavies or whatever, uh, start to yeah. come in. But yeah, I, I think that there's, there's there's a variety of of certain things um to take into account there but uh yeah the the biggest is definitely get your design shit in order so it's not just a huge headache for the people who are printing it (laughs) yeah no it's all good i don't mind it i mean i've gotten so so used to taking shitty art and making it work for and not shitty like the design i just mean shitty as far as like the the quality of the file um but taking shitty art and making it work for printing and that's all from just like the diy like the hardcore that like just from being in hardcore yeah you know just like making designs myself and having to like <clears throat> make them better and, and same thing with like because i used to do audio engineering too and i i like i had to take really shitty conditions like recording and in, in like a garage with like four microphones and make it sound good or whatever and so i'm used to taking shit and making it sound good or look good yeah both. yeah same thing with me sometimes you have to you know realize that there are going to be some dummy proofing that you have to do whether on your end or you know what you receive so you know just just making it happen and, and making it uh making it work is the biggest thing um so cole the last segment or question that i ask all my guests on the podcast is a favorite mosh story that they would like to share so that doesn't necessarily need to be something that you did something that happened to you something at a gulch show whatever is the first thing to your mind is how we'll uh wrap it up okay i'm not i'm not gonna talk about the first one that came to mind but um my favorite mosh story okay i'll i'll, I'll kind of I, i'll touch on on the one there's a f- a very incriminating photograph of me about to punch this person in the face i'm just gonna that's all i'm gonna say it, you can it, you can probably find it but um man my favorite mosh story i don't know man sorry i have to say that was like the charlie brown football tee up and then pulled away at the last sec (laughs) i can't talk about i can't talk no that that's totally fair there's um, no pressure here (laughs) but uh god there's so many man like anytime like theo the bass player of hands of god like whenever he he moshes which is not very often he just fucking levels a room and it's hilarious um so that that's always a good story but god dude mosh story there's like too many because san jose is like like out of all the places i've been back in the day it was like one of those violent scenes i've ever seen so like just there's so many i don't know if you want to call it a good mosh story but i've seen some people get fucked up um so i I don't know i don't know if i have a really good mosh story somebody broke their broke their elbow moshing to one of my bands because they were they went to, I won't say who it is, but they went to go two-step and I think there was some water on the ground and they slipped and they put their hand down to catch themselves and their elbow just like inverted. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it was during, it was during a song called the river of pain. And so it was yeah, just yeah. so ironic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He slips on water and then, and then breaks his elbow. And it's like, dude, that was truly the river of pain. Dude, That is straight up from like a, like a, like some kind of sitcom kind of thing, just like, all right, this next song's <laughs> River of Pain. And then all these people are just having these traumas of, uh, of breaking elbows. But that is really funny. Um, well, Cole, this has been a really fun time. Um, I've learned a lot on the printing side as well. So that's always, you know, something I'm trying to do with this podcast is, you know, ed- you know, entertain people, but also educate on what people are into outside of just the music side of things. Um, anything you want to plug, any handles, websites you want to shout out, um, the floor is yours for whatever you want to send people off with. For sure. Um, I am literally only going to shout out one thing. And so that means that's really important. So I want everyone to listen to Ingram. 
from Boise. They're like one of the sickest bands. And I swear if they were from the Bay, they would be so much bigger. And I think that they're, that people like are like, oh, it's from, they're from Idaho. So like whatever, but they're a fucking sick ass band and everyone should listen to them. I want to hard echo that. Uh, I've, I've gotten the pleasure of seeing that band twice and love all the people in that band. Um, I'm very excited for their upcoming, I think it's an LP that they did in mm-hmm. Chicago, but uh, yeah. I it, can tell you that I, I've heard it and it's insane. It's so, <laughs> it's so good. It's stupid. Like it's so good. I, I don't know when they're releasing it. I heard it like a fucking year ago. Um, so I don't know when they're releasing it, but it's, it's really good. Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to have. Um, is it Ross or Calvin? I've I've heard both things. Uh, the guitar player. <laughs> it's funny because I've heard both. <laughs> I, I have heard both things too. Right. I believe he goes by Calvin. Yeah, I, I've been. You know, Ca- Calvin was someone that I early on was like, "Hey, you should come on the podcast and talk about ingrown and guns." And from the last time we spoke, he seemed down for it. So hopefully that happens yeah. and comes to fruition. But yeah, I, I appreciate the ingrown shout out. I think more people need to get over the, Oh, they're from Idaho bullshit. And just, you know, recognize that that band fucks hard. So, um, Oh Cole, yeah. This, Cole, this has been a blast. Um, all of his handles and web- websites and whatnot are going to be in the sc- description of the video. Um, and then in the show notes, um, yeah, I, I love, uh, the time that you gave and just hearing the, you know, seeing the need in your scene and providing that. And, uh, the fact that you can do that full time is hella sick. So, um, shout out to you and, uh, thanks for coming on. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me.